what my rules are. Um, you have to now yeah. make and some. It, and it's, yeah. And it's mm-hmm. so evolving. Don't you agree? I mean, yes. I know Absolutely. at one point there was, I mean, think about tattoos. We had a no tat um policy you know, code. For a lot and, of and it's and it's almost impossible to find someone who's not, you know, yeah. So um, these days. So it, it evolves. It evolves. We just but you know it seems as if the hotel sorry, has a better grip on their employees and they seem to for abide by their rules. No, better. no, Miss Dorset. Think about no. this. Do you you must only go to Atlantis. You must <laughs> not go to Bahamar. If you go to Bahamar Ballet, they're all tatted up their neck, down their arm, down their leg. Now, but that right means Atlantis, that Bahamas policy is different. Yeah, but no, you're saying about the resort. So Bahamar is resort. I'm just saying. Right, that's right. Not, no, you know, no, that's I'm right. saying like some of the hotels are, but I mean, I use Atlantis as one of the stricter ones, eh? They are. They're very clean. And yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they have their rules in place and you know what you're coming into. So you can't come and try to force your way on them. And I mean, that goes in, in all circles, eh? Because now, you know, we have this movement and we have all those things. So it should be that a standard is set and you have to abide by that. And if you go outside of that, it shouldn't be that the rest of the society has to conform just to suit one or two individuals when you have a standard set. Um, but that's what has happened. And then they turn it into, it's a form of discrimination. So then where does it end? No, I completely agree. But I just feel like the evolution of, and I'm hoping I'm not, you know, insulting anyone like with millennials no. or what have you. It's just a difference, you know, as we But continue. is it evolution, if it's, if, if it's evolving or is it just that, they don't want to abide. They don't. They want to have their way. No, my my thought is this. Um, pretty soon, you know, we're we're aging out. We're maturing, right? Right. Uh-huh. And if that's going to be the source pool, Miss Dorset, uh-huh. then unfortunately, as an employer, if that's your source pool and that's what it is, then you do have to begin to yield. If indeed that's who we have to source to fill positions. I'm not, you know, and, and again, I'm really on the side of not doing this, but uh-huh. once again, if that's your source pool, then that's what I'm saying about evolution. So like it or the, not, yeah. Right, but I'm saying it's either, you see what I'm saying more or less is it, there's two sides. So either you're gonna be stringent and you keep, you hold fast to what you believe in, or you're not going to water down your beliefs to suit other purposes. Because I'm saying if you are not able to get a job, unless you conform and you go all over and they say, no, we are standard of this, that, that, you're going to conform, eh? But if society now conforms to your way, then we've changed what we um, hold fast to. We don't have, we don't hold fast to any beliefs. We just evolve. No, I, 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 I hear you. I'm just yeah. getting that out on the table. Yeah. As, as being I mean, because it's because, always two sides. Because because I guess, that's, the, that's the other mm-hmm. side to it. But I'm just saying, you know, that, that's um, more or less what it is. Because now that's why these rules and these acts have to constantly be changing because they're now trying to conform to what society says is acceptable. You see? So that's what this more or less comes from. So that's why you have laws changing and who causes the laws to change is society as a whole so what was common practice many years ago is not common practice now so now they have to adjust their um laws to suit the purpose any questions or we cover we cover that good (laughs) Yep, that, yeah, was that, was, that was yeah, that was pretty good. Okay, good. Okay, so now we go on to various forms of kind or kinds of discrimination. Various forms or kinds of discriminations against an employee or an applicant for employment on the basis of race, creed, sex, marital status, political opinion, age, or HIV, AIDS, by dismissing an employee or refusing employment to an applicant are prohibited or forbidden under section six of the act. 
The claimant so, must show so they're covered under section six from these things, eh? Yeah. Did they say anything about the parents? No. Okay. Go ahead. The claimant must show that the reason for the treatment he received from the employer was discrimination under one of those bases. Discrimination may be direct as well as indirect. It occurs directly when an employer treats someone less favorably on any of those grounds that he treats, treats or would treat other people. It occurs indirectly when an employer applies a condition or requirement which on the face of it affects everyone equally, but in reality bears more heavily on other groups of people. So that's where we come with that locks and the Caucasian, that, that would be in that, that's an example of that, eh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that condition could be, could get in there. We could incorporate that example in there. What you think? Yeah. So it occurs in, indirectly when an employer indirect. implies a condition or requirement, oh. which, okay, on the face. See? Everyone it, equally, it but says really it's equal, okay. but you know that it yeah. will only affect really one certain group types of people. people, right? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. A discriminatory requirement or condition need not be made explicit so long as it can be shown that it existed in the mind of the employer, i.e., it can be inferred from the evidence. See, Rainey. So see, right. So the inference could be there, and you have to prove it now. Once you you accuse me of something, you, it's on you to prove. So you have to prove mm -hmm. it. It's not for me as the employer to say otherwise. You're the one right. who brought the accusation. You have to prove that that's what the case is. So you would need to have persons or somebody who would be able to give evidence on your behalf to say this happened to me as well, this happened. And in this instance, it didn't happen to Jane over here or John there. Okay. Go ahead. So okay. we be now on so equal C. pay. We on C equal pay. Okay, shall I continue? Yes, please. The Act establishes an employee's right to equal sorry equal pay. The Act establishes an employee's right to equal pay in circumstances where a the work done by the claimant is either the same work or work substantially the same kind of work to that being done by other employees. Sorry, that read a little weird. <laughs> the work performed by the claimant is rated as of equal value to that of another employee in the same establishment. The performance of which requires substantially the same skill, effort and responsibility, and which is performed under similar working conditions. A claimant under this category in order to succeed would therefore need to rest his case on a job evaluation study. Okay, so we have, so we have, we know this normally happens here in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if y'all are aware of that. Yes. It, it is, it is blatant. And, but nobody really says anything about it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they, um, not any offense to you, Ms. Lafer, they also, they think foreign is better and not in the instance of cut. It's usually an instance of color. So yes. sometimes you find that in workplaces. So, you know, we're not open about um, discrimination here or prejudices here, but it happens very subtly. Oh, it does. I yeah. have been treated um, better mm -hmm. um, in an establishment, in a retail establishment downtown. Until then they ask, well, what cruise ship did you come in? I said, oh, <laughs> I, live, I reside here. <laughs> and it's a little different. Like it flips almost mid sentence. Yeah. So you you in a different category then. You just one of those. So the next time I just say it, I came on Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. So it happens in the workplace as well. For sure. Okay. Um now we are on pre-screening for HIV AIDS. Okay, I'll read this section. Thank you. Um, Pre-screening for, for AIDS, HIV. 
The law, out, the act outlaws the pre-screening of employees or applicants for employment for HIV AIDS and does not affect any other law or contract term which stipulates a retirement age, section six. It provides the, prohib the prohibition of against discrimination against employees or applicants for employment stipulated in section six of the act shall apply. Is that Muteus? Muteus? How do you pronounce that? Mutinous? Okay. We, I seem to have lost where I was just now. Okay. Mutatus mutandus. It's a Latin word, of course. Mutatus mutandus. To disable mutatus employees. mutandus, yes. To disabled employees, unless the employer can show that the job requirements relied on as grounds for hiring the desirable, the disabled person at a lesser rate of pay are reasonable, or the disabled person cannot be accommodated without undue hardship. Hmm, that's interesting. Right. So to disabled employees, unless the employee can, employee can show that the job requirements relied on as grounds for hiring the disabled person at a lesser rate of pay are reasonable. That's the part that has me stumped, Ms. Dorset. Right. At so a lesser rate of pay. So what they're saying is basically you would need assistance. So as much as you may be disabled, they still have to provide you with additional assistance, eh? With accommodations, yes, I understand. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you may not be able to move about as much, so they may have to, somebody else may have to be assisting you in getting things done with a normal person can just do on their own. But now, what they say about that? Um, can you say, Ms. Dorset, can you say that again? That was, uh, okay, tell me what, 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 what I said. That they, so a disabled cannot be accommodated without undue, I, I don't get that part. Refuse no, I don't have hardship. Yeah, I get yeah, so, that one. So it could be, um, it just may not be convenient for us. It'll cause more problems for me to try to accommodate a disabled person in my workplace. It will mm -hmm. cost me extra money. That's hardship. Yeah. It will if cost have me to, to, have yeah. to build certain things and place all these things because my place wasn't outfitted to accommodate them. As much as they may have the qualifications so, for the job they have applied for, I'm right. unable to um employ them because it will cause undue hardship on me as an employer to bring them in right yeah. and so, it's okay that's what i'm saying it's okay to do yeah, that though, I mean. so they're saying that um unless the employer can show the job requirements relied on as grounds for hiring the disabled person at a lesser pay of rate of rate of pay are reasonable so it has to be reasonable that i have to give you less than what the job would have actually paid. So the job was paying $400, but I'm only going to be able to pay you $325 based on all that I have to do. Okay. When you would have done three persons' oh, job, okay. one okay. person. Okay. That's job. what you're saying. Okay. okay. That makes sense. So and then the second, it's reasonable. And then in the uh, other instance, I will not be able to hire you because I cannot accommodate you. It will cause undue hardship on me as an employee just to right. bring you in. And right. that is like key, me like... bringing in a foreign person to work for me. I have to pay their house and yeah. I have to pay for their children. Pay their to permits. School. I have to and do all that. I don't need, right. I can't hire you. So more or less. Right. right. Now that I understand is maybe a domestic, but I wonder how that's classified for an organiza organization here that is for undue hardship. For, I, I work for Big Pharma, so it was $6 billion company. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I'm just gonna throw it out here. What do you guys think was our max for an undue hardship? We're 6 billion. What do you think it was? What was our, 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 our cap for saying it was a hardship for us? 100,000. I mean, uh, for an employee, <laughs> a, a single employee? A single employee, yes. I would think, um, if you have to accommodate them by um, implementing more than 100,000 just to accommodate the employee, that's, that's a bit much, eh? There was no cap for us. There was nothing oh, wow. that the, 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 the law said there's yeah. nothing for a $6 billion company that would be undue hardship. Oh, my and that's true. I mean, oh, wow. we had someone that was a quadriplegic. And so we mm -hmm. had to widen the doors in the bathroom to his office into the building and oh, wow. and you know if you think about it six billion a hundred thousand is nothing 
you know, but yeah, they didn't give us a cap. I just threw it out there to see what the <laughs> she was <gonna> say. <laughs> that is crazy. So you could bankrupt me just to accommodate an employee. Yeah, but, but if you think about it, what, I mean, really think about it, what, what could you even come up with to accommodate someone that would be over a hundred thousand? I mean, like what, throw something out. What do you think would be a hardship? Like to accommodate someone, not like really think about something, throw out anything, throw out something ridiculous. Nothing really, right? <laughs> I mean, it could be undue hardship. Like, yeah, what are you going to, like, what can one person do to bankrupt the six billion for a disability, Ms. Doris? <laughs> but I mean, they could come in there and I didn't widen the doors enough and your pockets. We'll just, deep. we'll just go back and have construction widen again. That's another, you know, 25,000. Yeah, but you didn't, I didn't widen it. And as a result, my wheelchair didn't fit in or I was stuck or I get thrown out. I got that. Now that's different if you're saying, yeah, if you're saying yeah. that what we did, you know, then disabled you further or something like that. Yeah. Right. But so in, in the furtherance of, of, of you trying to accommodate me, you now could be bankrupt in a minute because your pockets are deep. I don't, I, I, I think based on my injuries, you have to take care of me for the rest of my life. I already was as yeah. much as I have pre-existing conditions. You knew that you were hiring me. You knew I was disabled. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. And you have money. I. It's not just based was, on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so. it's different for a company our size for the quadriplegic. You know, we were very, you know, exact to the inch. You get his wheelchair, you make it, you know, you, you get professionals, you measure, you try it out before he comes, you know, all of the above so that there's, you know, no, nothing. Uh, you know, that's what's going to happen here in this Bahamas. Yeah, no, but what I was going to say is, so, so that was just a, that was just a fun question to throw out, but yes. here, I'm just wondering, like, undue hardship, I wonder, like, truly what that looks like to, to pour if someone needs just a ramp to enter the door, like, is that well, an undue hardship? You know, hardship? some of these companies are only holding on, um, basically, they're juggling, so the minute you throw something out of the ordinary at them, that could be the case, because then where does it end? Um, I may widen the doors and then you may find when you turn this curve, the kitchenette that I have there is, I can't, you can't, I can't be accommodated in there to make my tea. The counters may be too high. You may have to reduce your counter size. Um, you could find and any that's, number. And that's things. interesting because are we required to provide you with tea? Right. But if you, that's, that's nice I said, you have a tea lady, but should I be reduced to only the tea lady making my tea? I should have a right to make my own tea. So you should accommodate me to make, be able to make my own tea. I may not want. We'll give you your own little stash for your desk. Yeah. Right. But, but now you put yourself in a position where I, I may um, now turn hot water on myself because I'm at my so desk. You're not, Dorsey, you're not, we're not talking about what's written here. You're talking about what could happen if we did. Yes, certainly, <laughs> certainly. So I'm saying, you're saying what could be on you hardship? That's how far so it can that's go. interesting. Yeah, you know, I never even thought about that. So you're yeah. saying, you know what? It's not the fact that I can put a ramp in. The undue hardship for me is if that the door isn't wide enough and I don't want to take that liability on. Or So you're talking right. about the so what now, ifs, not the where does if it end? Can. Where, where does your accommodation end? Because you may find something else when you start working after now, do something different. And we didn't we didn't envision that when you first started, but now we found that out three weeks in. And, and I've already hired you and now I can't tell you go home because I should have been, I should have worked this out before. So now I can now say it's not, I can't keep this person on because I, it'll cost me undue hardship. I cannot afford to do all these things that would make him comfortable, him or her comfortable to work here or accommodate him or her working here. And that I get, right? If you hired someone for one thing mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you put them in another position that their, um, you know, their disability um, is not suited for. I think that's a little different than when you're hiring someone and determining, going back to even, you know, I think it was Samantha who spoke about asking the right questions upon hire, right? right. This is what the job requires. Um, I think we we're talking about childcare earlier, but if this right. is what the job requires, is there anything that can prevent you from doing this, right. doing this job, right? Um, and but you don't have all the answers or the questions initially, because you know, as relationship develops, you find out more things you need to find, you want to find out about someone. 
or more things now come to a head. So, you know, they usually say you have to take time. So you have to go through the four seasons to find out how are they in spring, summer, fall, winter. So that's the seasons may happen in your workplace. How do they perform in this environment? If they had to do this, because, you know, things come up daily. It doesn't, you don't have a set or a way of things happening because life happens. So as life happens and the job happens, things can happen. So you will find that now the person has been working with me probably for a year. And we find now that they've worked well enough that they need to be promoted. And their promotion may now require for us to accommodate them differently. So, it, I mean, it's just like we said before, it evolves. Your, your work environment constantly is evolving as um, work happens because you don't have the same problems every day. So that could be the situation with a disabled person. Eh? They could, you could find that, well, we didn't even envision this happening and he didn't see this, foresee this happening, but it happened. And so now you've already started the ball rolling and it's now undue hardship. So, I mean, at what point you cannot hire them initially because you would have envisioned it. If you didn't envision it and it now occurs on the job, um, is there anything that stops you from telling them you, you it's no longer um, able to work out? We can't move from here. Because now you're not the right fit anymore, eh? Or do I even have to give cause? Do I, I, do I have to give you any cause as to why? Not if you do it at will. Right, so I may just say, you know, don't worry about it. I pay you out and that's the end of that, eh? But don't do it right after you would have had an instance where they asked you for something because then we know it was mm -hmm. cause, eh? Tied to that, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. My apologies. Sorry, I dropped. Um, I think my internet dropped out there. Okay. But I see that we carried on. <laughs> So I'm back though. Okay. So okay. now we are on standard hours of work. What are the standard hours of work? 40 hours. 40 hours. And, 40 hours. and what else? What happened before um, 2002? What the hours were? 44 hours. Okay. 44 hours, yeah. Now, is this 40 hours across the board to all employees or this has exceptions? Definitely exceptions. Okay, so let's go on to section six on 72. Tell, let's read that. On page 72, sorry, section six, go ahead. So section six one ensures that no employer should take advantage of an employee. The employer must not allow overtime work without the payment of overtime. Where by reason of the nature of the employment, the hours of work of any employee are required to be irregular. The standard hours of work in a day or a week of any such employee may be calculated as an average over a period not exceeding four weeks. That's in section 8.2. It is provided that the hours of employment of an employee employed in any industrial construction, manufacturing, or transshipment enterprise, or in any essential service as stipulated in the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act or law enforcement service may exceed the standard hours of work in a day up to a maximum of 12 hours. And the minister responsible for labor may by order include other enterprises or services in this category of employment as he deems fit. Is this kind of what happened during um, COVID, like with essential workers and where they were and how they were working? Is this right? So now this we fall under this, here, right? So this happens now in the instance of well, the policemen usually put in long hours, and we have construction workers, we have persons who work to the port, um, manufacturing, um, so that could be like the water people, eh? Aquapiotos and all that stuff. 
essential service in quotations, if you require to um, work an essential service, unless you have an agreement, what type of agreement we may have? But says otherwise, what, what type of agreement we may have that may say, I, as much as I'm in essential service, I don't have to work these hours. What agreement that could be? You mean the employment contract? The industrial agreement, eh? Okay. So we may have an industrial agreement in place. So as much as I may be an essential worker, the industrial agreement say, notwithstanding, we made a negotiation that if the nurses work more than 10 hours, they would be entitled to a certain amount, or if they work in the night, they may be entitled. So you see, this doesn't provide that, eh? This doesn't say what time of the day you're going to work. They just say up to a maximum of 12 hours, eh? Right, it doesn't say the time. Right, so the industrial agreement would cover you in this instance if you were in a in, in a union, eh? Okay. Mm -hmm. You see, but now this is important because you see those construction workers, especially on the port now, they work from six to six in some instances. Um, and so some people are telling them, you should get time and a half once you've worked your eight hours, but is that the case? Can they no, get ten and a half after eight hours? No, after twelve hours. Yeah. They have they after yeah. twelve hours they can get it, but not because they're in a they're in a what type of they in what industrial construction manufacturing change shipment or who, whatever the minister determines as an essential service, eh? Right. So, Mr. Orson, so what happened to like companies like when they changed? the law to a 40 hour work and some companies remained at nine to 5.30. That doesn't so, fall under this category. So no, so they cover themselves now. So what they do is I don't pay you for lunch hour. I don't have to pay right. you for lunch hour. Right. So that covers me and you only have to work 40 hours. So we go 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five. You've worked, you only work in seven and a half hours actually. Because I don't have to pay you for your lunch hour. Oh, okay. Right. So that, remember, they put that stipulation in there. You don't get paid for lunch. And that's how they still ended up. You still work in the hours that you... The eight hours. Yeah, yeah. eight hours. Because that's what we do. That's what we do. We don't, you don't get paid for your lunch hour. So, so still most companies adopted that practice. They don't pay you for lunch yeah. hours because they want you to work all the um the eight hours, eight that hours you're supposed total. to work. Especially um those who keep in bankers hours more or less and the bankers week not on um, Monday to Friday. But we can't even say bankers week no more because they haven't working Saturday now, eh? But Monday um, to Friday they closed it too. Yeah, <laughs> Monday to Friday. So in that instance, what they normally do is if they um they may have them off through the week or they may give right. them time a half or, day. Right. A half day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I you could make up that time how you see fit. So you may say, well, I want you to work this Saturday. So this week you may only have to work half day on Monday or something like that. Right. Yeah. So you just shift your schedule to suit the purposes. Because they only need to have 24 consecutive hours off. They could have that on a Sunday. Right. So they say we, we could continue. Okay. The provisions of this section eight of the act do not apply to any person, person who holds a supervisor or managerial position in his employment. Section eight, four of the act. These provisions underscore the importance of informing an employee of his status or job title at the time of his employment or in the case of change of position during the employment. So you can't um, say, well, I'm a supervisor. If I'm, you can't expect me to be working supervisor's hours and you have not given me that in my job description, eh? Right. Again, the manager or supervisor has to be careful too that they are not keeping these long hours because then they start to make less than the janitress, eh? 
Because mm -hmm. if I'm making 100000 and you're making 30000 and I'm working twice the amount of hours that you work in the same week, um, what it works out to be. So sometimes that supervisor manager role really don't pan out, eh? They just get you on the cheap and you don't realize it. So they get you to work for two or three persons in the same instance and longer hours because you have to make sure everything is in place and done. Okay, go ahead. In every seven day period, an employer is obliged to allow an employee at least 48 hours of rest with not less than 24 hours of such, with not less than 24 of such hours being consecutive. Each 24 hour rest period is referred to as a day off, section nine of the act. So you have to give them 48 hours of rest. It doesn't have to be consecutive, eh? The only consecutive one has to be 24 hours. So they they always get in twenty they get more than forty eight hours of rest day because only eight hours are required for them to fill in each day for you, eh? Uh -huh. And then you're giving them a whole day off or a, half, a day and a half. Okay. How is overtime calculated? Overtime performed on a public, on a public holiday public or day holiday. off. At twice the regular rate of wages. And what else? Time and a half, the regular rate of wages. So that's in other cases. Right. So overtime only on a public holiday or day off, you get twice. And during the week or on your regular time, it's what? Time and a half. Time and a One half. Hour. What about the employees in the tip category? work their regular rate of pay other than in respect of the section day off in any week. So what would they get? Regular, yes, regular, regular pay, regular rate so of pay. So he don't get overtime? No. He just gets his regular rate, except mm -hmm. where? Second day off in any week. Yeah. So if he has one day off. Mm -hmm. Oh, and if he worked, you mean if he worked that day, then he get paid for that day? Second day. That's the second day, okay. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't get paid in the instance of his second day off, eh? He wouldn't be paid regular rate. That's what we're saying more or less. He would not? No. What do you mean? What would he be paid? Time and a half. I don't know. So what, what about his first day off? It's referring right. to his second day off in any week. But what about his first day off in the, in the week? So if they're he saying he should be paid in respect of overtime, work at his regular rate of pay. Mm-hmm. Other than, because now do they get paid? I don't know. Do, do the hotels get paid? For public holidays? Yeah. Yes. I guess the industrial agreement will cover them, eh? They, get they will have an industrial agreement to cover them, right? Because right. if we were following this, would they get it? What do you mean? If we would they get them? paid? Would they get paid for the public holiday if they don't have it in their industrial agreement? Yes. Would they? Oh, no, it's overtime. No, because it will, it will be considered overtime. Right. They're just saying it's overtime. It seems as yeah, if it... they won't get paid. They would not get paid. They're saying their overtime is at the regular rate of pay. They're not paid twice or time and a half. Is that what no, it's stating here? That's what it's stating. Only in respect of the second day off in any week, then they would, then the overtime may be calculated differently. So if you don't have an industrial agreement in place or you're not part of a union, what happens? 
then you're like, treated, treated like a regular employee. Like a you're regular... going to be treated. Um, and so you will not be paid for overtime, eh? No. Okay. I didn't realize oh. that. I thought it was just, okay, so yeah. if you are not, if you are not in the union, then you wouldn't get that if benefit. You have, not just that you're not in the union, you should have an industrial agreement to cover you because these, okay. these, um, so that's fine. To cover these um, loopholes that are there, so that should be stipulated in the in the industrial agreement in there. In there, so the industrial union, agreement the surely will will look will cover this because they would know where the pitfalls are in the act. Right. Okay. You see. Right. So what about sick leave now? What someone else to read or should this continue? You can continue. Okay, sick leave, part three of the act. The act requires an employee to serve a qualifying period of employment of at least six months with that employer before becoming entitled to sick leave benefit. An employee who has been employed for at least six months with an employer is entitled to one week sick leave with pay in any one year where he is prevented by illness from performing his duties. No employee shall be entitled to receive payment in respective periods of sick leave, which is only one day long. Sick leave cannot be accumulated. Sick leave is a benefit which an employee is entitled only when he is sick. It is not to be looked upon as a, as a vacation leave. So as long as the company um, follows this as a minimum, correct? Because yeah, ours is far minimum. more generous than this. Okay. Yeah. You see, you know, if you don't have it in your, if what we what we doing, if we don't have it in our um, contract, what are we doing? We are doing what? We adopting the law. Uh, so we adopt whatever sections where it doesn't where my contract doesn't speak to it. The Employment Act will take precedence. Yeah. So you could say, well. You know, I've been working here um, for almost two years now, and she still only gave me one week. My contract never stated I was going to give you more than a week sick leave. I didn't even speak about sick leave. I tell right. you, refer to the Employment Act. Right. Employment right. Act say you only need, you one have week. one pay. week. Right. And with pay in any year, right? Right. But what they say about payment it doesn't. Does it say it's paid? Yeah, you get it with pay. One week. Well, one, one week is paid. If it's only one day long. With pay. Oh, what you're not it, paid if it's not if it's just a day of sick leave. Yeah, you don't get paid. Oh. You are not entitled. That's probably to why a lot of employees stay out for more than one. <laughs> right. Um, unless you provide a sick slip. So they have that section in there too, in section 11.1 of the act. 11.2, sorry, of the act. You could get paid if you could provide a six slip. Well, we don't do that. So you're saying, okay, ours is seven days. And if you are out, we had a, an employee out last week, one day. Mm -hmm. So you're saying they should not get paid for that day? Not if they don't produce a sick slip. There's, they're not, you're not required to. You can but pay, but required, it's not required not by law. Required to, for two, you're not required for at least two, two, two or more days. If it's just for one day, then you're not yeah. really required to bring a sick slip. Right. It's on but, the, actually on the third day, right? That's not, I think it depends. See, it's I think it depends on the two more days. I don't think so it's stipulated by law. Right. See, now... You, as an employee, employer, would mm -hmm. set out what you expect them to bring in if they're yes. sick. Yeah, right. Now, as, as the employee, Our if I want to be paid, I need to bring in a sick slip to be paid. Well, ours is two or more days. Ours that's is two or more days. days. No, yeah. that's that's for them being out. I'm saying for them to be paid. Right. No. They, Same. We're with they Samantha. Can, they're paid. They, yeah, they, they're, they're paid. We pay them. But you're saying they should not get paid for the one Well, you don't day? have to pay them that? if they only out for a day. You don't have to pay them if they don't bring oh. a six step. Okay. Well, required, Samantha. You can, but it's just not required by law. 
Yeah, oh, you don't. Okay. They're okay. not entitled to receive payment for one day off because I mean, you've been off one day. G, you were sick, or you just had a headache. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to see what I'm saying is most employees will say, I what I could pay to the doctor, I could just skip that day of getting paid. Mm. Okay. You see? Right. No, we pay them. Some people just automatically do so, but it's you're not entitled to do so. Okay. You can't accumulate sick leave and you're only entitled to that benefit when you're sick. It can't be combined with vacation for sure. Now, some people yeah, will say, I was on vacation and I got sick. So, of yeah, course, you have to yeah, bring in your six step, right? You bring in your mm -hmm. six step. And mm -hmm. if you only have two more days left for me to pay you, well, I only have to pay you for the two days you were sick. So, well, this, this, okay. So, because I, I had a case like this, and um, the person actually got COVID mm -hmm. while they were on vacation. Right. And so they were out for the required, what was it, two weeks that they were out? They were out for two, two weeks. And they came back and they said, oh, I, I should still take vacation because they say sickness over took precedence over vacation. So they're sick. They were out for two weeks. Uh -huh. They were on their third day in, on vacation. And they right. got COVID. Mm -hmm. And so it was mandated that they be home for two weeks. Yeah, but what your sick leave policy is? Well, our sick How much leave time do they get in a year? Seven, day, seven days. Okay, so if they were out for two weeks, they've used the full seven days if they've not already used their sick days. Right. Now, in terms of vacation, mm -hmm. they, they, they say they, were, they got sick on their second day of vacation they were entitled so you will to give them back with, you will give them back what they're entitled to for sick for their sick leave if if you want it what they're entitled to remember they're entitled to sick leave they're entitled to a sick leave seven days right. sick leave right so if they have so, seven days left they could have used that um because they got sick provided they give you a six slip eh? right they did they did okay uh-huh so they used up the seven days because they were out for two weeks. Okay. So the rest of it doesn't count, eh? That's their vacation they would have used up. That's, you that was my position. Them, huh? But that was my, and that was my position. I said yeah. to them, you used up your seven days already out of the two weeks. And so I was going to do the remainder as a part of your vacation. But they right. can't so the like remainder, that. No, you, they didn't no, see it that's, like that. No. The remainder is their vacation. That's nothing to do with you if they're sick beyond the time that they're entitled to be sick, it would be up to the employee to say with employer to say, I'm going to give you the time back, but that's, you're not in, obligated to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes it'd be, that'll be your, that'd be my, my loss as I, I'm on vacation and I got sick and I don't have any sick time to claim back. Right. Would you bet then be able to maybe say unpaid sick days and just claim from NIB? Is that an option? But I don't have that as an employer. I didn't, I didn't give you any unpaid sick days. I only gave you one week to be sick. Mm. So okay. it's up to me not to say, well, I'm I'm gonna allow you to be sick. But it, um, I will, I will, it's nothing you can do. I just won't pay you. I'm, you know, I won't, I don't have to pay you, but you're sick. So I can't do anything about it. You're sick. And you just claim from, but that's what she's saying. You just claim from NIB. Right. But now right. how does that affect your employment is another thing. Because how often are you sick? If it's not in the instance of COVID, then that will now affect you on the job as well, because then I mean, even the government kicks you out after a while, eh? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, but I mean, it's, honest, not, it's not repetitive. I mean, it's not repetitive. We, we, I did that, you know, we did have a case where um, we had a case where someone was out for a month with COVID when, for, when it first started. Yeah, well, I mean, that's back. different. That's, that's different. a different okay. instance, okay. right? I'm talking about where you just always call in and sick. Oh, mm. yeah. Yeah. 
because I was going, I was, what I was going to say is I think particularly post COVID, you see a mm -hmm. lot of different type of respiratory illnesses and people yeah. being uh, not with yeah. COVID, but they, they're sick, sick for a prolonged period. Yeah. Yeah. But and, flu, especially with flu or yeah. cough or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, as an employer, you kind of want them out of the office because they're sick. Um, right. So, yeah. So I think like for us, we, we only do five days as well, um, sick leave, mm -hmm. but I see that not being adequate nowadays to be, to be truthful. Um, cause one low, you mean for them to be paid cause they can be off, but they're just not paid. Right. Right. Paid because right. like I say, one round of flu and you could eat up those five paid days. And I mean, and these are people that are genuinely, they came to work sick. So, you know, they are sick, you know? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I mean, as much as you may, it's only business, you see, at the end of the day. And only so much you can do as an employer to say, well, I could be paying right. someone and they're not here. So, I mean, you have to look at it from both angles as well. It's not that they're being harsh, but it's business at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, that's why I wondered if, if at that point, then NIB would kick in so that at least there'd be something. Well, but NIB you will kick in. Um and then, you know, they have their own rules. But take, yeah, because they take out the first five days, right? You don't get right. And then the they may say, days. well, you know, they may ask you for all kind of reports. Because, I mean, even them yeah. don't want to. So. Yeah, that's true. Imagine if, if NIB, where you paying your money to, don't want to pay you. Imagine the employer who is trying to do business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but on the flip side of that, um, that when I mean, employers are... Um, they tend to force employees to come to work sick because if I'm genuinely sick and um, I feel as if my employer is not going to pay me, I'm going to mm -hmm. come to work. Yeah, because so, you need the money. You need the money. So there has to be some human side. Yes, there's a business side, but I think uh, there has to be a human side as well. With respect to the, the earlier question, when you talked about somebody getting sick on vacation, mm -hmm. of course, um, with the bank, if an individual is sick, um, the bank gives them their vacation days back. So, um, they... well, I mean, you know, we would look at it in terms of where you're employed. Because if I have a small law firm and I only have my secretary there and me, and she's sick, you think I could afford to pay her? And she's off for a month. And I, I'm trying to operate a law firm um, with only me one working, answering the phone, or when I move, the place is shut down. So, so, she has it, to come to work, so she has to come to work sick then? No, no, she won't be able to come to work because then I'm in a, in a closed space. So mm -hmm. she would be off. She would have to now claim her benefits from national insurance, which is the purpose of her paying national insurance. So you're saying that you but, won't pay but, her to be sick? No, I won't pay her. And... Okay then how often can she be sick and I can continue to employ her? Because if I'm only a small operation, I need somebody to be there, right? So as much as there's a human element, that's what I'm saying about business, it still has to make business sense. Because I can't um, facilitate saying that, well, oh Lord, I'm sorry, she's sick, I have to try to, and so I'm trying to do all of these things. And the purpose of me having her was so I can have assistance. So if she's often sick or she can't come to work, how long can I continue to say I have an employee when it's it's turned away around where I am now her assistant and she's not assisting me? I'm I don't I'm back to square one and I'm still trying to do business. That's what I'm saying from a business perspective. Because in a bigger establishment, they have people who may be able to fill the role, but in a small environment, that won't work out well, eh? Uh -huh. That's, so, that's the business part I'm talking about. So Ms. Dorset, I'm sorry, just going back to the one where, you, where we ask um, the females in particular about small children, because sometimes, or whether they have a good family yeah. support system, yeah. and it's because right. of the same thing, because if you don't have a good support system and you're going to always be out if the baby's sick or mm -hmm. from school, mm -hmm. then it will affect productivity. And so that's but, why but see, it won't be discriminatory that. if you are asking these questions of everyone. That's what I'm saying. You have to make sure that it's a cross the board question. Mm -hmm. It can't be only directed to the females. 
Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So you don't want to say, well, when the fellow called, you say, well, I interviewed for the job. They didn't ask me that. Mm -hmm. Then you say, well, they asked me that. I So I feel discriminated against, you see? Because we could have a talk right in the, in the waiting room waiting to be um, interviewed. Right. Understood. Or we may come back for a second interview and we start to talk. And I'm saying to them, He'll, he, I'll say, gee, these people ask me all kind of questions. I don't even know if uh -huh. I get the job because I, uh -huh. they ask me about my family. And then the fellow might say, they ask you about what? They didn't ask me that. You see? Yeah. So you open the door um, if you don't ask it across the board. For a point back of clarity, um, please, not to belabor. But um, sorry, I, I didn't even get to see who that was who said about the vacation with the banks or whatnot. So for clarity, let's say um, you said they, they, you, the bank will give them back their vacation. So if they were on vacation for two weeks, you're saying that they are allowed to take two weeks at another time? Yes. Of their vacation? Really? Oh, okay. If they, if they were sick, because the bank allows 12 days. Oh, so different. that's the difference. You have you have a longer period. Yeah. So, so that's okay. not the same instance. So, so we're then, talking about where it's only one week. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we have twelve days. So the so bank. Week. So the bank will allow that person to take their twelve days vacation at another time. Ten days. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. wow. Well, okay. Yes, we, okay. If the person same, got same sick, thing at the law firm. Yeah, if the person okay. got sick during their vacation and has the sick slip to prove it. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, but that's in the end. See, you, you're a bit different, eh? Because you, you only have five or seven days. Right. So that you, you're doing the same thing. It's just that they're a little bit more generous with their sick time, eh? Because the government mm -hmm. gives them 21 days. So mm -hmm. government workers have 21 sick days. Mm -hmm. So okay. I mean, so they even have more time like that. So it's, it's relative to the time that's available or allowed. Okay. So just, okay. So what Ms. Ms. Dawson, um, cause this comes up quite a bit in my, in my workplace. So mm -hmm. for clarity, what would, for us as in, in my business establishment, if our work, if our sick days are seven days, mm -hmm. so what would the law say in terms of, of, of what would the law be in terms of, granting them vacation time um within the the if they felt if they fall sick if there okay, was seven so, days so what would the so you now if they had 10 days vacation and yes, they got they sick 10 on days. the second day right they would be able to reclaim the seven days that they have available or be paid for those seven days okay okay um now if they would have gotten sick for the do for the entire vacation of 10 days. Right. They had no sick time left. Then right. that's them because you only allowed seven days. Okay. Okay. So okay. I think in the same instance with the bank, eh, the bank is not gonna pay you beyond the sick days they allow. Yeah, no. Right. So it's the same difference. That's right. what I'm saying. It's just the time okay. frame is different, but it's the same difference. You given them okay. back only what they're entitled to. So the, okay. and so, and so therefore, in that example, the Samantha had was it ten days of vacation? If they use, and they were sick on their second day, they use sick time, and they get that vacation back. They can get the vacation time back because they didn't use vacation; they used their sick days. Mm -hmm. So it's not sick. Okay, mm -hmm. you see. Now, in the it. instance where it. they want to get their vacation time back because they were sick. They're going right. to produce a sick slip to you right. and right. say, I want to get my seven days back. You're right. not going to pay them because you're only allowing them seven days paid. You're not paying them. They're going to go to national insurance and claim that benefit. Mm -hmm. In some instances where the workplace would pay you, they would ask you to go ahead and put in the benefit and yeah. sign over the benefit to them. Yes. Okay. So it's covered either way. Okay. 
Because okay. by right, if I am sick, um, you're supposed to get what? What the sick, what the sick with pay is. You given me six um sick days. What what mm -hmm. national insurance kicks in? What national insurance gives you? Do they give you full your full salary? No, 60%. Okay. So the employer is only responsible to find 40%. 40%, right. Yes. Yeah, so I could give you pay with pay. For so am I gonna pay you? What, what do you think? Can we play with that to say that? Is it actually that I have to pay you the full sick day or do I have to pay you 40% until you claim from national insurance? Um, I don't know. Right? Hmm? What happens in maternity benefit? What do you do? Do you it's pay the them full? You just pay them. What you pay we them? Keep them on, we keep them on full pay and then they turn over the benefit when they return. That's for us. So, so isn't that the same no. thing with sick leave? Okay. We do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's more or less the same thing. So if they are getting paid from you, you only have to pay 40% and they could claim the rest from the national insurance. Because with yeah. pay is what? What is with pay? You pay a national insurance a certain amount as an employer for them to pay them during these times. You don't have to pay right. them the full thing, mind you. Remember that. Right. You only have to pay them the percentage that you are required to pay if they're sick. Right. Even though you say they're entitled to be paid for one week, that payment is only the percentage that national insurance doesn't provide. Right. So you understand that? Yeah. Because some employees may think they have to pay them the full thing. It's your discretion. No, you. no it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's your, I, I know, I'm aware of that. It's your, we do okay. it at your discretion. I'm aware of that. Right. But we so usually everyone, pay. Un everyone understands that, right? Yes. No, yeah. I didn't realize yes. that. Hmm? I yeah, didn't you realize. don't have to pay. You okay. don't have to pay the full. You can use your discretion. You don't have to so pay the full. You just opt to do the full. Okay. For the yeah. five days. Right. Okay. You you mm -hmm. you don't have to. You only have to pay what you're supposed to because you pay in national insurance. So the employers don't take back the money that they don't utilize the services that are available to them as much as some um, employees don't as well. Because if you pay a national insurance, you as an employer are responsible for the majority of the payment aid, and you do that yeah. as an insurance. So if your right. employees get paid, I mean sick, you don't have to find their full salary. Right. That's so right. That's the maternity. Right, that's the benefit of national insurance. You putting something aside to assist you in the instance your employees get sick or something else happens. Okay, I thought that was for the after five, you know, after the five days where they would step in um, for a prolonged period, but I didn't realize. So after the five that. days, you may not have to pay them at all. Right, but even after the five days, and I'd be still is only going to pay them a certain amount, right? So they, they'll be they only only pay the same amount that they normally pay, whether it's where they're getting it from the employer and both. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you see, they can still claim national. They can still claim national insurance, notwithstanding you're paying them for the seven days if you don't go to national insurance and put in your claim. You understand that. That's why most employers tell the maternity benefits um, persons, I'm going to pay you your full salary, but you're going to turn over the benefit to me. Otherwise, they will duplicate their payments. And you know, that was an issue with government the other day, where people were getting paid double. Mm -hmm. Double right. different. Right. And you do and you do know, um, I mean, you do know that they don't tell you what they what you get paid or what they pay you, right? They don't tell. Who don't tell? Tell me. National NIB? insurance won't. NIB won't tell you what they paid the person. Right. Why not? Why not? They won't. That they is won't. Paying, that's between. That's but that's, that's not. Them, that's, yeah. Um, that's, that's not. They pay, that's not our business. No, that's not your business as an employer to know what I my benefit is. See. But mm -hmm. if we're paying, if we're paying into NIB for them, we're not entitled to know. 
You are entitled to your portion. Remember that. Not their portion. You don't have to know mm -hmm. what they pay them. You don't have to know what they pay them. Because your business is only I your business. Someone, I guess someone told me, because I called over and they readily gave it to me. I've only done it once. Well, you know, this is the problem with mm -hmm. we haven't workers who don't know their job. Yeah. Because I because you know that was I the try. I tried that was, and I was told I was told that's not my business. <laughs> yeah, remember, I don't know. We did data protection act in this in employment. No, not okay, because now you're the controller of, of data and that information should be disclosed only to the pro so you disclose an information that's not for public knowledge. Yeah, Remember? and it's interesting because pre. I don't. I can't say pre when it occurred, but now NIB does direct deposits to yeah um, to employee, their account, employees because before there were checks that they would have to turn over, right? So right. you would find out because of the check signing them over. Right. But now, to your point, um, if we're not supposed to. We meaning an employee, you're not to be privy to that. Then no. they can tell us whatever and just give us back. Whatever. Right, because <laughs> that's not you should, that means I can call up to NIB and find out anything. Listen, right. tell me if what what Joe was getting paid, what is maximum mm -hmm. he was getting, what, what the maximum they were paying him on. Because he tell me he making he was making 1200 a week. What y'all get a month from him? Right. And they say well only they only paying him based on eight hundred dollars a month. So you know what the cap is, six hundred a week, eh? Right. So now that means you've disclosed information that's not supposed to be given out because your national insurance business is yours. So the Data Protection Act covers that information and that's what they had an issue where they were dead given out those NIB numbers to these people to create cards. Right, right. And they, right, and they had that right. big deal about it's, that. Remember, remember that, that shouldn't have been given that. out. Right. Yeah, I remember because that. Then you mm -hmm. find out everything. You could go and steal all of these people's information because you know their data bird, you know all these things about them. Yeah. Because National Insurance readily gave the information out to a yeah, third party that. to create these cards. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to cover some more bases because we look like we got into plenty of discussion. We ain't getting far. Which is good. Which is really good. It's really good. <laughs> yes. So let's try, let's try move a little further. So we finished with sick leave. Yeah. What we say about what the employer could do when you claim in sick leave? Have an independent um, assessment, physical That's assessment. Yes. Yeah. If they, um, and, um, and may refuse leave if the physician says you are fit for work, eh? Yes. So didn't the, the prison put a prison or didn't they take a prison officer to court and had him jailed for producing fake six, six, six yeah. yeah, I remember that. I remember right. that. So that means that. they questioned what he was producing, eh? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so that just happened the other day. Yeah. And that's government taking that position. So my Lord, what about the small little employer, these little mm. private employers, they should be able to exercise their rights as well eh? mm -hmm. okay yeah. let's do vacation leave i'll read the act Anyone provides that i'll read the act provides that an employee is entitled to at least two weeks vacation upon the completion of each 12 months of employment the vacation shall be extended by one day for every public holiday that occur occurs during that vacation. Section 12.1 of the Act. An employee shall pay, an employer shall pay to an employee who is entitled to vacation, a vacation pay based on the basic pay earned by the employee during the year of employment in respect of which he is entitled to the vacation. In respect of an employee who has been employed for six months or more, but under one year, one week basic pay. In respect of an employee who has been employed for one year or more, but under seven years, two weeks basic pay. 
in respect of an employee who has been employed for seven years or more, three weeks basic pay, section 13 of the act. The vacation pay shall be paid to the employee at least one day before the beginning of the vacation, section 14 of the act. Okay, now we know this, this is a offense the government is guilty of all the time. I don't think they pay their employees before the vacation. They have a standard um, set date. You get paid whether you are on vacation or not, the same time as everyone else. You realize that? Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I don't think they get paid vacation pay. They don't, they don't pay people for vacation like that. You get paid, I think, the same time every month. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That, happen, that happens with us. Yeah, that happens in the bank as well. We, if you're if you're on vacation this week and your payday is not the week you're on vacation, you're not going to get that paid. But you see, the act says you're supposed to pay me before I go on vacation. Mm. So that's offensive to the act. Eh? That's contrary to the act. So mm -hmm. the employee, the employee could really demand that they get paid. I mean, I don't know how favorable they will look in the employee's eyesight thereafter, but I now mean- they, they, what we can do is you can request your vacation pay before you go on vacation, but it's not a norm. But it should be mandatory that they receive it because the act says they shall be, not maybe. Mm, okay. The act says you shall be paid to the employer at least one day before the beginning of the vacation. Why going on vacation? I don't know money. Hmm. Okay, let's continue. When employment ends before, sorry, where employment ends before the completion of one year of, em of employment, employer shall pay any vacation owing to the employee in question for the completed year or years of such employment. For any uncompleted year, the employee shall pay on a pro rater basis of the basic pay earned by the employee during the uncompleted year, section 1-5 of the act. But the employee is not ob obliged to pay vacation pay unless the employee Read that again, sorry. But the employer is not obliged to pay vacation pay unless the employee has been continuously employed by him for a period of 90 days or more. So that's usually the, pro the probation period, eh? Yes. Between three to six months. Okay, let's do maternity leave. Maternity leave and family leave part five of the act. The Employment Act 2001, the act, apart from the basic right, which it confers on female employees who become pregnant, that is the right not to be unfairly dismissed on ground of pregnancy, also confers on the female employee who becomes pregnant, the right to maternity leave and pay. Every female employee is, in addition to her annual holiday or leave entitlement, entitled to maternity leave upon delivering to her employer a medical certificate from a registered medical practitioner or a certified midwife stating the expected date of her confinement. To qualify for the grant, she must have been continuously employed for at least 12 months with that employer from whom she requests such leave and is not entitled to maternity pay during such maternity leave for the employer more than once in every three years. Subject to the employee's desire, the maternity leave shall be for not less than 12 weeks and shall be so arranged that she is allowed not less than one week before the expected date of confinement and a period of not less than eight weeks from the date of confinement. Where so we, confine mm -hmm. we know the, the time frame for maternity leave. We have that down back, eh? Yes. Okay. Now there was a little twist in that, but I'll get back to that. When a <laughs> confinement when a confinement takes place 
without an employee having been granted maternity leave or the period of maternity leave before her confinement amounts to less than four weeks, the period of leave after confinement shall, if the employee so desires, be extended so that the total period of leave does not amount to less than 12 weeks. Where an employee has been granted maternity leave and the date of confinement is a later time from the date stated as the date of confinement, her maternity leave shall be extended to include the period that elapsed between those dates, section 18 of the act. So can you break that down for me first, please? Ms. Okay, so where confinement takes place without the employee having been granted maternity leave before her confinement, or so, you mean, so, so where she, she wouldn't could, be granted maternity leave? Say it again. Where won't she be granted a maternity? What instance where she won't be granted maternity leave? I haven't been granted. She's not entitled. She worked less she's than 12, 12 if months. She's work, if she's worked less than 12 months. Or if the maternity leave happens within. You remember this once every three years? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Once every right? three years. Okay, right. Uh huh. So, what they would, so without the employer having been granted maternity leave or the period matern of maternity leave before confinement amounts to less than four weeks, the period of her confinement, if the employee so desires, may be extended so that the total period of the leave does not amount to less. So, she's always entitled to 12 weeks. Yes. She's always at the entire 12 weeks. Yeah, 12 weeks is the law. Right. You remember it used to be eight weeks. Right. They changed that. Now, where the employee has been granted maternity leave on the date of confinement is later than the date stated as the date of confinement. So they told her she was having baby um, March 27. It's now April 12th, and she's just having the baby tomorrow. Okay. She still's gonna get that period. From and from the March from from the March or from the April? From the date when they told her she was expected to when they told so her she what would, if she what if she was to work? Well, that's the difference. What that's they said that okay. if she had taken okay. the time off and she was anticipating she would have had baby the baby since March. Okay, so she was off. Okay, okay, right. So her maternity leave has now been extended. Would it extend beyond the 12 weeks? Yes. Yes, because her confinement period was already given. She'd already taken the time off and they're right. not going to allow her to miss out on her time because the date of confinement was incorrect or the child didn't come when because it's it's not unpredictable. Eh? It's unpredictable. Right. right. So she's entitled to what? 33 and a third percent of her wages. Right which does not exceed the national insurance ceiling on insurable wage. You, you see mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So what that means? You pay her $1,200 a week. When a maternity yeah. leave comes up, what you have to pay her? 33 and a third percent of what? Of the 1200 no. no. What's the maximum? Six. Is it six? Seven forty. Seven forty. Six hundred. No, six hundred is the cap. That was six hundred. The cap is six hundred. Oh, okay. Oh, really? So, so you could actually hold this to the letter, and only pay oh, them wow. on the, on the six hundred. Really? Uh -huh. Oh wow. Because what that's, oh. were you covered for such things? What what section helps you out with that? So you see how the employer and the employees don't know their rights and what are, what are you see? Yeah. Yes, all these things. So section 17, one of the act tells you that. So you don't really have to pay them the amount that you actually pay them because you only entitled to give them 33 and a third percent of their wage. Unless so you have something different. 
in your employment contract. So you may say we will pay you maternity benefits at your full wages. You may not have put that in there. No, we don't have that in there. So if you didn't put, you say and you're giving them the full, then they expect the full. If you say we will defer to the Employment Act for maternity right. benefits and payment, right. then that's where it kicks in. That's what we have in there. We refer to the Employment Act. Okay, so then they only get paid on the cap. Up to the cap, because some of them may be making less than the cap. So you're only paying them 33 and a third percent on their wages if it's less than the cap. Because national and insurance only paying you on what you pay them. Right. You got that? So, okay. One of them we had, uh, okay. So it's, it's 33% on the cap. 33 and a third percent. Percent on the cap. Right. It's what about $200? So 600 times, I think that was the case, so. yeah, about 200 a week, or a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, okay, I think that was the case. Mm -hmm. Now, some employers are more generous and they pay you based on what your salary is, and they tell you, Let Nash Insurance send me the difference. Mm -hmm. So that means they only get and paid the maximum, which is 600, which is. The four hundred dollars, eh? Yeah. Less, more or less. We we working with, we we just leveling it off as dividing six hundred by three. We're not being precise, but more or less they'll get about four hundred dollars if they decide to pay you your full um salary. You see that? You understand that, eh? Or most of you know that based on the benefit that comes back to you. Because right. national insurance won't pay you six hundred dollars; they're only paying you what they entitled to pay, which is sixty six and what? Sixty six point something. I remember right. that. Yeah. Right. So now, they're not a third; they're sixty six six seven or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sixty six point something. Right. Um, now there was a case when, um, live birth only. Is, I, I remember having to deal with this a couple of years ago. Um, the baby, the, the person lost the baby. No, um, I don't, was, they speak to that for that benefit payment, but you still on, you still have to take some time off. You wouldn't have the yeah. full time. Right. They, had, you, they still took some time. They still had to take some time off. Right. So they'll get, they'll get, they'll get leave based on the sickness that happened as a result. So it results as a, uh, um, from the maternity, eh? Because we still treated it as a maternity though. It is still maternity. The maternity, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now is paternity the same thing or is it different? No, I think paternity, they get paid one week, eh? I don't know. Okay. See, it, it, that's where we go into family leave next. Okay. 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 Any questions? Okay, let's speak of when the employee dies during maternity leave. When the employee dies during such maternity leave, the guardian of the child shall be entitled to any unpaid maternity benefits due to the mother from both the employer and the National Insurance Board. So that's automatic. That's, that kicks yeah, in. That's, yeah, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do family leave. An employee who has been employed for at least six months with an employer is entitled to family leave of one week a year without pay on the birth of a child, death or illness of a child, spouse or parent. Evidence of such occurrence must be produced to the employer, sections 20 of the act. This is one of the new benefits introduced by the Employment Act. So that covers the male. Okay. Yes. Okay. Job how is this protection. A, how, is this a how is this a benefit? Oh, because it's without pay. 
if you if I mean they parent, just want the time <laughs> off. If your parent dies, you get you get a week without pay. Really? That's a, that's one. a good one. Why is that a benefit? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a benefit because you have the time off without them looking at you differently, eh? To say you just taking time off. Yeah, we get 15 weeks of paid paternity. I mean, it's that game we're talking about discrimination, right? Father's <laughs> rights. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't do anything. They just, the woman has to go through that. Their body has to heal. That's why they're getting the time off. But the bank gives us one with, with pay. That's a benefit. So that's a benefit from the bank itself. What, what do you give? Um, one week with pay. Yeah, and we do three weeks with pay. Yeah, we do 15 days. Mm-hmm. It's quasi government you work with? I do. Because they're pretty generous, eh, with, with the taxpayers' funds, eh? <laughs> <laughs> See, look at you. Don't want to give anything to the men. <laughs> Don't want to give anything to the men. Now, before you were beating, you, you were beating these young ladies down about asking questions that were discriminating. <laughs> but now you want to give the dad a little bit of time. It's different. <laughs> oh, because he only take a time off to say the baby cried. Oh, the baby's That's crying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's look at job protection. I'll go ahead. Okay. The act provides protection of employment to the female employee who is absent on maternity leave and also to an employee who is absent on family leave. It provides that an employee who has been granted maternity leave is entitled to her seniority rights and to return to the job in which she was employed and uh, and on terms and conditions not less favorable than those which would have been applicable to her if she had not been so absent. Section 22 of the Act. An employee who is absent following a grant of family leave is equally protected, except where there has been a serious default or gross negligence amounting to abandonment of duty on the part of a female, or there has been an express contract of service for a fixed term which has expired, no employer shall dismiss or give notice of such dismissal or require a female employee to resign during the period such an employee is absent by reason of maternity leave. An employer who wishes to dismiss a female employee who is absent by reason of an of an approved maternity leave, except in the circumstances stated above, is restrained from taking such, such action until a return from the maternity leave. Section 21 of the Act. This provision applies mutandis, mutandis, to an employee absent on family leave. Any employer who contravenes or fails to comply with any of the provisions shall be liable on conviction to a fine of $5,000 and may, in addition, be ordered to pay to the employee any payment due to such employee under the Act. So in this instance, um, you know, usually where um, the employer wants, would have had reason that they wanted to get rid of the employee before they would have gotten pregnant, they would have to wait until they are complete, their, their time is up and they have to return to work. Unless you can prove um, or you there has been some serious default or gross negligence amounting to abandonment of duty. You see what I'm so you may you may have wanted to fire and all of a sudden she came to you and said, Oh my goodness, I'm I give I've given you the slip to let you know I am expecting and I expect to be confined within the month of June. And you and your human resources was just preparing to get rid of her. Now you can't get rid of her, eh? No, you have to wait till after. So as soon as she comes back and she walks through the door, you could give her Oh a, really. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize. I didn't realize it was soon as they get back. Okay. Yeah, you could stay back on the job now. And okay. You know, work continues, so you could get rid of her when she comes back, eh? Okay. But now she was on maternity leave. And then you would want to show cause in this instance, eh? Because it doesn't seem right that I just came off maternity leave and you just said. Yeah, that's what I was. That's what I was about to ask. So what you have to. 
So you should have had okay. some paper trail or some disciplinary or grievance procedures in place that would have assisted you in showing that you would have warned her. She's continuously done this and the other. And your intention was to get rid of her long before she would have gone on maternity leave, but you adhered to it and then you waited until she returned. Is it possible to dismiss um, with uh, notice, without notice and pay in lieu of notice? If yes. when she returns from a yes, company, yes. Uh -huh. get a, a company yes. up in. Yeah, you'd have to pay in lieu of. Right. Unless what you will amount to. What do we call that? What, what? type of dismissal Unfair is that? Unfair dismissal. Unfair dismissal. Unfair or wrongful? Or wrongful. Is wrongful, wrongful, wrongful that we don't dismissal. get notice, eh? Is yeah. unfair uh, based on why you fire me, eh? Mm. If I could show you you dismiss me because I was pregnant or I, I, I was on maternity leave. So it may be unfair in that instance, but if you didn't give me notice, that's wrongful, eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just get two weeks in the world. Well, you it just can't be two weeks. It have to be everything else that goes along with it. Oh yeah, yeah. No, everything else is supposed to go along right. with it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's try redundancy. You think we're gonna get through everything? We only have because y'all could read the rest of them, eh? I like the discussions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but please. <laughs> um, this, once we get through this notice period and summary dismissal, I think you would have done well enough to move on. We're not going to read everything. Let's skate over some and just get into the discussion. How about that? Okay. Okay. When was, um we have the right of redundancy payment being first introduced by the Employment Act in 2001. And it was um, introduced for the purpose of compensating a long serving employee for the loss of his employment. It is not intended to cover the actual loss the employee suffers, um, but it is just to sustain him during the period of search for another employment where he's entitled to compensation even if he he's entitled to compensation even if he obtains employment elsewhere immediately after is dismissal by reason of redundancy. So notwithstanding, I may be on another job, you still have to pay me my redundancy pay. Okay. Okay. In order for you to be alleged eligible for redundancy, you have to have been employed for more than a year or at least a year. And you would have had to be dismissed for redundancy. So you said the position is no longer available so don't put nobody else there doing the same job because you said that position is is made redundant yes at okay, least 12 so, months right at least 12 months right at least 12 months, right? at at least 12 12 months, months you were working yeah. right so the main reasons attributable to redundancy is the employer cease or intends to cease to carry on business for the purposes for which the employee was employed or has cease or intends to cease to carry on business in the place where the employee was employed or the requirements for the employees to carry out work of a particular kind or to do so in the place where they were so employees have ceased or diminished or expected to see or diminish. You think this happening in the bank? Because, I mean, the computers could take over these people's spot, eh? <laughs> wow. But they don't seem to care much, eh? They surely point you to the computers quickly. So oh. you find that a lot of... That's why they could have closed so many branches, eh? In certain banks. Yeah. When they had the oh. big let go of RBC and, and, and all of those. And Scotia Bank closed down all these. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's because now they, they're making their, those positions redundant. So in that instance, I should be paid, eh? Yeah. So where they have been, um, where they're on a fixed contract of less than two years in respect of a special, specific construction project and such term has come to an end, they will not be deemed to be dismissed for reason of redundancy because they're on a fixed contract, eh? Mm, okay. And, okay, it's different, yeah. Yeah, that's different. Yeah. Where the employer closes down operation altogether, 
That's the first part. The second mm -hmm. part in B is where the employer closes only a part of his branches. That's the instance where we talk about with the bank. And they under the third situation, that C is where the employer dispenses with employees doing certain work altogether. As in the case of introduction of labor saving machinery or reorganization of work so that fewer employees are needed to do the work. What did you find that Atlantis did when they let go of all those people? What they started to do? Made them, did they, they make made them redundant? Them redundant. redundant. And what they did? They paid them out, right? They paid hmm? them out. They paid them right. out. They paid them out. And what they did with the work that they were doing? Oh, I don't know that part. They subcontracting work now. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you have you now have people who are contractors, independent contractors, and they hire okay. these people. So now Atlantis don't have so many employees under them in their purse anymore. Eh? These people oh, work independent people now. So the groundskeepers okay. are someone else. Remember, Atlantis had their own groundskeepers. So they would so do reports. So what do they have? What do they have now? They what do they do? What do they do they're now? They're using they using a company to keep the grounds, and now the okay. company is responsible for those employees. Eh? Oh, okay, okay. I think okay. even in the situation with the lifeguard, they have um they have a independent company doing that as well. Eh? Oh, okay, okay. I think that's how they reduce. That's how they made um they worked that out. So they just pay the company. Right. And the company okay. is responsible for those employees. Right, for their employees. Oh, okay. Right. Didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's what they've done. So we have several cases in Grundy, Ted Inton versus Willis. The Employment Appeal Tribunal say that the tribunals must not decide what they would have done had they been in the management shoes, provided the employees have applied their mind to the problem and acted from genuine motives. They cannot really be faulted or be said to have acted unreasonably in choosing one employee for redundancy to another. So you can't say based on what I feel. So you can't, you can't put yourself as a tribunal in the shoes of management to say you feel they acted, they preferred this person over the other mm. in when they would have now approached the tribunal for a ruling. And Brown mm. Stockton, the House of Lords said that the selection of a woman for redundancy because she's pregnant and will require maternity leave is a dismissal for a reason connected with a pregnancy and is therefore deemed to be unfair. If it cannot have been intended that an employer should be able to take advantage of a redundancy situation to weed out his pregnant employees. So redundancy will be frowned upon if there's a pregnant employee and you choose to now yes. say you're redundant. Yes. Where an employer provides gratuity or non-contributory pension for an employee, the employee is not entitled to both redundancy pay and the gratuity or non-contributory pension, but the employee shall select the one which he prefers. So what you think in that instance? I provided yeah. you with a pension that you don't have to even put any money toward. Mm. I'm giving you gratuity. You're not entitled to redundancy pay and the gratuity or the non-contributory pension. You only can get one. So section 264 of the act provides that you can't have both. Okay. So in the instance where the employer contributes to your pension. But what's they, the percentage? Where they where they where's a non-contributory pension though? Mm. Now, in the instance where I am contributing a portion, could I now use that towards your redundancy pay, you think? No. No? Why you not? Contributed it. You, you get what you put in, do you not? Yeah, if you're yeah, not vested, you because you may be vested. Because I may say you're vested after a period of five years. You're fully vested. That means you can get both my portion and yours. Yeah, right. you can get both when you're vested. Right. So I may, as an employer, say, well, listen, that portion that I was putting, consider that a part of your redundancy payment. What do you think? Mm. Wow, that seems unfair if you're vested. <laughs> if, yeah, you're vested if you're not vested, you don't, you're not even entitled to it, eh? 
just no. what you've contributed. Right. Well, and it well, and it depends on what the vesting is, right? Like ours is um, accumulative, right? Twenty five percent each year up to four years, then you get a hundred percent. So whatever portion you're vested into, right? You can get on a prorated basis then, because it's not correct. being prorated. Correct. Yes. Correct. So, so you get a portion thereof. So you fully vested. So that was yours. Notwithstanding that, that don't make no sense. Isn't the same thing happening with the non-contributory pension, and you were entitled mm -hmm. to that anyway? Mm -hmm. So, isn't that the same difference? What you yeah. think? I Pretty would much. think so. <laughs> no, why but, not? But I'm sure the law is saying different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, could we could make a case for that, eh? Couldn't that's not yeah. black and white. That's a gray area we could work in, eh? Mm. Yeah. So it's just to show you that nothing is straightforward. It, you still have all of these little corners that could turn. Yeah. Okay. In Crompton versus Truly Fair, the applicant was employed by the defendants in a factory. The defendants later sold the premises together with the plant and machinery to another manufacturing company. The applicant became employed by the new manufacturing company, although the nature of the work differed. The applicant claimed redundancy payment from a former employer. The court held that she was entitled to succeed because the court found that although the physical asset had been transferred, the business was not. She was entitled to redundancy payment, even though she was subsequently re-engaged by the new manufacturing company. What we talked about that earlier, right? That's interesting. So they only bought the building and then she happened to be hired by them is that correct not the business just the building is that what they, they're saying right so they 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 the, the nature of the work differed but she should have been entitled to redundancy payment eh? notwithstanding yeah yeah they're two different companies absolutely yeah, yeah so she still should be entitled and the amount of redundancy payment is determined by reference to the date of the employee's redundancy by starting on the date and reckoning backwards the number of completed years of employment, allowing two weeks basic pay in lieu of two weeks notice and two weeks basic pay for each year up to 24 weeks. So what's the maximum you could get? 26. For, for a manager? For no, this employee. Yeah. Maybe just recess. 24. Oh, how many how many weeks two she weeks two, two weeks, weeks. so 26 no, i mean how many years was she with them i don't i think i missed it no what is the maximum they could get as employees oh 24 24 weeks what about Plus the two, two weeks. weeks so 26 yeah 26 Plus weeks 26 yeah right. what about what about where i'm holding a supervisory or managerial position one month one month one month, one month, and then salary. one month basic pay for each year up to forty-eight weeks. So, what's the up maximum they could get? Fifty-two weeks. Fifty-two. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, payment of redundancy shall be made on or before the date of the employee's redundancy, or it oh, may okay. be covered as a debt due to the employee in proceedings before the industrial tribunal. Yeah. Now, now this, Miss John said, can you pay that? up front or can you pay that over a period of of how long no can, what can they that? what what did i just tell you what i just tell you about vacation pay they didn't say may okay you shall pay me right and now oh, she was asking is it always a, or were you asking samantha if it's always a lump okay. sum or over a right. period of time okay. no you, it's time. hard and fast that if you were if you could make me redundant you should have the money to pay me mm. You can't make okay. me redundant and, and don't have the money to pay me. Okay. And what should I be doing? I get and pay it as if I was still working, what that is. I have, to be, I have to be waiting on you to pay me every week. That's what you're telling me. So mm -hmm. you might say, that's, that's, what, yeah, on it. that's what we did with our last company, but it was a benefit because we continued, it was called pay continuation. So you continue mm -hmm. to get paid as though you were employed, which also continue your um all of your benefits so it was an overall benefit for an employee to have pay, what we call pay continuation versus a lump sum but how so long, if you have if, long, so if you have for the entire it? time so for instance if you like for you know 
And if you're entitled to four months, you continue to be paid however you were paid before every two weeks, the 15th last day, monthly or whatever it was, you continued on the same pay cycle, inclusive of full medical, dental, vision, and contributing towards the pension. So what you're saying actually is you're not redundant. I am paying you to stay home. Yes. No, you were, you were redundant, right? That's you're, you're, no longer physically come, you're no longer physically you're no coming longer into work, working. correct? Right. right. So you Not continue then. to pay me. Um. So you let me know, well, when this time is up, then I'm, then Everything is going to be completed in four months. I'll because I can't pay you all up front, so it's up and to it really me as the employee. Yeah, and it wasn't about not paying up front, but again, this is a six billion dollar company, right? It was more of a benefit. I know, I mean, I would have preferred that, right? If this was something I had because I continue to get once you're paying a lump sum, everything cuts off, right? right. Yeah. So it was a benefit to be on what we call pay continuation versus right, getting. So some people kick the in where they are, but what I'm saying is it may be a hardship to the employee to not have to constantly come back and forth, or you may not, or for you to just say, you let me go, but you can't even pay me. And your work is continuing. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I guess if you see it that way, yeah. Yeah, and it's their entitlement that you should have paid them before you, they would have, um, that last day would have been. Mm. Yeah, so I was saying here, it's like, you're just cut off. Yeah, right. here you just cut off, here's your money later, peace. Right, <laughs> the employer can't unilaterally decide that you can sign this because I'm making you redundant and you're going to have to get your money over the period of six months because I, I, I don't have it. That's not your decision to make. Yeah, and I guess you keep saying that that's the reason why. It's not because you right. don't have... Anyway, we can argue that, but I understand right. what you're and saying. What I'm saying is yeah. I may want to go to recover it as a dad and I may want interest on my money because you will, you keeping my money all this time and that was mine. How could you be using my money for your benefit? No, I got and, it. We, and yeah. we gave it as an option. There was no one, Ms. Dorset, who said, give it to me now. Everyone right, said, but, in, but that's... For benefits. Right, that's in that instance. But in this instance, in the Bahamas, you've been made redundant. There's no continuation. You, that's it. We drop you right here. So all your benefits stop. So now, whilst I'm waiting on my money, I don't have any national insurance being paid. Um, I love to go claim unemployment benefit in the meantime. Um, I may have been getting sick pay. I mean, um insurance part payment my pension was being partly paid and I don't have any of those things but you tell me now I should bear with you while you try to give me my money over a period of time you're so describing it not like how I said it but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine just Doris if you want to water it down <laughs> I said to take it to the next level boy <laughs> you want to go to Samantha? Yeah. Samantha what did you say She's taking it to the next level. I know. You, Every you, time, you, I was like, is she listening to what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, no, what happens is you have to go to the extreme because you have to see as much as you see it from one angle, you have to see it from another angle as well. Absolutely do. If I mean, for those companies going back to, if it's a hardship or what have you, give me my money now. If you're anticipating, you know, you're redundant because they're going out of business, that might right. not happen if I'm waiting for it. So I absolutely see. Right. So you're, you're going to have, what I'm saying is you you must prepare yourself to have this contention that I will, I'm giving you, you're going to have that contention. So in that instance, as much as you may see it, you're going to have people who are adverse to what you say. No, that's, that's not going to work for me. Cause you see it on TV. No, you don't let me go. I want my money. You know, they stand up in the front of your building and carry yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we in a smaller society and money don't flow like that here. Benefits definitely are not given out so freely. Um, and so you're going to have some angry birds in the front of your place. Understood, for sure. I understand. Yes. But I have to be a little contentious and adversarial so you all will see what you all will expect yeah. as human resources. Yeah. Devil and clap, devil devil not, not, not if you pay out what they're entitled to. It is what right. it is by well, law. Well, I mean, that's I not going to happen. It's, it's, I think it's more, I think it's easier for what you're saying to do and not being contentious. We have paid right. you out by law what's required. But see, most people don't operate 
above board in smaller in a smaller setting because you may you dealing with big big companies you may be dealing with like in this instance government or banks where their money may be a little bit their pockets a little bit deeper but when we talking about a smaller company they may now be looking for loopholes or they may not genuinely be able to do anything better and they're going to meet that contention non but because I am angry that you let me go so I'm not willing to work with you because you let me go you better have my money I you see, I vex. I should have had my job. Absolutely. Okay, I don't want y'all to go past nine o'clock. Let's try termination. Termination. What happens with termination? Six months or more, but less than 12 months. One week's notice or one week's pay in lieu of notice. One week's pay or part thereof on a prorated basis for the said period between six months and 12 months. So that's six months or more, but less than 12 months. You get one week pay and you get one week basic pay for the said period between six and 12 months. If it's between six and 12 months, we now prorated um, the one week pay. Right. So you may get one and a half weeks or whatever the, the period is, because you may have started in August and I'm letting you go in June, so I'll prorate your last um, week based on the amount of months you would have worked. Where the employee has been employed for 12 months or more, we have two weeks notice or uh, two weeks basic pay in lieu of notice and two weeks basic pay or part thereof on a prorated basis for each year up to 24 weeks. Employee, it holds a supervisor or managerial position is one week, one month's notice or one month's basic pay in lieu of notice and one month's basic pay or part thereof on a prorated basis up to for each year up to 48 weeks. Now, this is interesting because they said an employee shall not terminate his employment until after the expiry of two weeks notice to the employee of the period of employment is one year or more, but less than two years, or four weeks notice to the employer if the period of employment is two years or more, unless the employer has been guilty of a breach of the terms and conditions of employment. Do you, know, do you know that, your, do, do your employees adhere to that? No, I didn't know it was no. four weeks if it was more than two years. We do it based upon um, if you're, um, you know, an employee versus a uh, managerial. So it's right. two for non-supervisory managerial and four. For, but um, some employees anything. just stop coming to work and they don't give you any yeah. notice. Do yeah. you have any reports? You're saying for job abandonment? Yeah, for them, they terminate That's their job employment. abandonment, is it not? If you don't come to work, they they have terminated their employment and started working elsewhere. But you you have any recourse against them? It doesn't say no, that you have to work out your two weeks notice, does it? You you should have some recourse because the law said they have to give me two weeks notice, eh? Yeah. So like they have recourse against you, the employer has a recourse against them, eh? Yeah, we have it in our, we have it in ours. It's indicated you have to give us two weeks notice. Right. Or if you're in a managerial position, it's four weeks. So it's the same thing. They they still owe you that um. That they owe, the two weeks. they owe you that notification, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see if anything else interesting in there. So summary dismissal. What happens? What section deals with summary dismissal? Summary dismissal section yeah. 30. Is it 33, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 31 of the act? 31 of the act, yeah. And what is what is the common principles? They dismiss the employee from his employment without notice and without pay in lieu of notice. Without pay in lieu of notice. When right. the employee has committed a fundamental breach of his contract of employment or has acted in a manner repugnant to the fundamental interest of the employer, what actions they may be? We have them listed below. Theft, fraudulent offenses, dishonesty. Dishonesty. Gross insubordination or insolence, gross indecency, breach of confidentiality, 
provided that this ground shall not include a report made to a law enforcement agency or to a government regulatory department. So breach of confidentiality could have happened where you could have called National Insurance, eh? And they give you yeah, information. and they give you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or where I call my friend and say, I just see so-and-so coming out of the bank. They have a account with you? Mm, the minute yeah. they say yes, they have breached confidentiality. They have breached confidentiality, yeah. You so know, we're in the, the medical. We're in the medical field. So if you are caught um, discussing or giving out information regarding a patient or something, that's yeah. breach of confidentiality. And and that should be. Um, you have more penalties, eh? Mm -hmm. Because now the data protection act covers you. Um, to deal with that instance, you may be um up for criminal um liability as well. Mm. Yes. Okay. So for the purposes of any proceedings before the industrial tribunal in order to succeed, an employee who dismisses an employee shall prove that he honestly and reasonably believed on a balance of probability that the employee had committed the misconduct in question at the time of the dismissal and that he had conducted a reasonable investigation of such misconduct, except where such investigated was otherwise unwarranted. One would, of course, expect that an employer would not go to the extent of his dismissing an employee from his employment in the face of accusations or allegations without a proper, proper investigation. There may be cases where an employee is caught in the act, so to speak, so that there will be no need for further investigation in this matter. So we have the Carnival Cruise Line case, which... Mm -hmm. um, dealt with the question of the burden and standard of proof required in cases where there has been um, accusation by the employer of the employees and they want to summarily dismiss them. And they said that in this case, um, let me just pull out the what your principle is derived in this case. So the test, the, there's a test in this that you need to use when you are um, establishing whether um, the employee has um, has acted in the interest in in breach of their contract. And you have to use the same words now. So when you use the words, you don't have to worry because now you're speaking in the language that is given to you. So you are summarily dismissing an employee from his employment without notice and without pay in lieu of notice because they have committed a fundamental breach of their contract of employment or you're dismissing them because they have acted in a manner repugnant to the fundamental interests of the employer. Let's try to read the case quickly. Um, in this case, Peter Zervos, the respondent, was employed by the appellant Carnival Leisure Industries as a supervisor of the Cassius Cage in their casino at Cable Beach, Nassau from 16 November, 1983 to 23rd February, 1984, when his employment was terminated. It was a part of his duty to oversee the work performance of all the employees in the area of the cage and also on the floor of the casino, prepare and submit time sheets on the staff. There was evidence from surveillance which seemed to ground management belief that the respondent had indeed been padding the timesheets to share support his claim for overtime. On investigation, management called on the respondent for explanation and he bluntly refused to give any explanation at all in respect of overtime being claimed. Instead, he issued threats. He was summarily dismissed. His claim for wrongful dismissal was upheld by the tribunal. On appeal, the Court of Appeal reversed the decision of the tribunal stating that the tribunal applied the wrong test. Okay. In upholding the dismissal, yeah. Melville J. with whom the rest of the lordships agreed said, there has been no challenge to the position that the burden of establishing the reason for somebody thing open for the there, there has been no challenge to the proposition that the burden of establishing the reason for the dismissal of an employee or the termination of an employee services lies upon the employer. And that is also for the employer to establish that the dismissal or termination is for just cause. 
Um, they said, see appeal of Princess Hotel versus Bahamas Hotel, Hotel Catering in which the judgment of the Court of Appeal was delivered. The later case also reaffirmed the proposition that if the tribunal was saying that if required proof by the appellant that the respondent had actually committed the misconduct complained of, and of then the, the tribunal would indeed be applying a wrong test in law. All that was required to be established was that the appellant had reasonable grounds based on the facts known to it at the time of the dismissal, which would create in the mind of appellant of the appellant a reasonable belief that the misconduct complained of had been committed. When you look at the findings of the tribunal, they had clearly applied a wrong test in requiring proof from the appellant that the respondent had committed the wrongs complained of. Accordingly, the conclusion of the tribunal cannot be sustained. As to misconducts, which at common law may warrant summary, you have to see the cases they are in. So what did they say in, in this instance? Do they have to now prove that he had um, actually conducted, he had parted the timesheets? Uh -huh. No, what, 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 that was the wrong test, what they were supposed to look at. All they had to be, all what was required was what? Carnival. All was required was Carnival had to believe that on reasonable grounds, based on the facts known to them at the time of the dismissal, which would create in the mind of Carnival, a reasonable belief that the misconduct complained of had been committed by Mr. Zervos. So they're saying that they didn't have to prove that he was padding the um, overtime the, or padding the timesheets. They just had to have a reasonable belief right. that, that he was doing that. Oh, okay. Right. So just suspect that he was. That's pretty much yeah. suspect that he was. Okay. So that was the test to be applied. So you didn't have to prove it. You had to, be based on, because then I, I'm not comfortable with you working with me anymore, eh? Based on uh -huh. what I've seen and what has happened and my beliefs, I may not be able to prove you stealing from me, but I know you are. I thought you had to have some proof though. So no, okay. okay. No, because it has okay. to be what they say about it. Where the employers committed a fundamental breach. See, you would have all you had to do your investigations, eh? Right. And based on all the surrounding circumstances. Right. It seems okay. as if more likely than not, this is what happened. I I can't get, I'm not going to be able to get it to the letter, but we, we're not going to move any further. I think you had committed some, you were dishonest or you had done some fraudulent um, things in working here. And now you are now in breach of your contract of employment or you may... Um, your interest may be repugnant to the fundamental interest of me as an employer. And basically, mm -hmm. I in a sensitive area, because, you know, if I can't trust you, you can't work here anymore. Eh? Uh -huh. And once I've conducted my investigations, if I didn't catch you red-handed, then um, that's sufficient. Because uh -huh. at the time, I believe that that was the case. Any questions? So what tests are we applying when we summarily dismissing someone? Where we don't have proof in the on right, where we caught them red-handed, what tests are we applying? A reasonable belief. We we're applying the test and what? You have to give me the how to answer. Come, how you writing your answer? We're gonna apply the test as set out in the case of? Oh. In the case of Peter Zervis versus Carnival Asia Industrial Limited. So where the employer has to prove that on the balance of probabilities, on a question and the burden and standard of proof required in this case where they are summarily dismissed, Carnival Asia Industrial versus Peter Zervis gives us guidance and they establish a test where all that has to be required is the appellant has to, the, the employer has to do what? 
had reasonable grounds based on the facts known to them at the time of the dismissal, which would create in the mind of the employer a reasonable belief that the misconduct complained of. Because what we say you get summarily dismissed for, what they usually use? Gross misconduct. Gross, like, gross negligence. Gross misconduct is usually the term they use. The misconduct gross. complained of has been committed by the employee. Yes, gross misconduct. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, I will leave you guys to read minimum wage and health and safety, those little sections, because so, you have page 158, which gives you all the information on health and safety at work and the duties and uh, section four and five of the act. And then um, we have, we de they deal with the minimum wage in there as well with the children. Okay. Okay, so you can look at um, page 158 and read over that to assist you with um, looking at um, health and safety at work. And then 156 would deal with um, the children being employed because you have to deal with the children being employed as well and the minimum wages are. So you all got those pages? Yes. Excellent. That was 158 to 159, is that right? One, you could start at 156. That will help you with minimum wage. And then you can go on to um, 158 to 159 to deal with health and safety at work. Okay, got it. Sorry, we were discussing so long, we didn't get to complete those. But I know it's past our bedtime by now. We were supposed to be finishing long time, but we got some work done, eh? Sure did. Yes, yes. ma'am. So hopefully we were, our classes were helpful in get, directing you where you needed to go. And I wish you all the best in continuing and um, having a successful term or um, course with the Employment Act. So you always oh, go this, off to do- This is our last it. time today with Ms. Dorset. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm only doing these two classes for them this time. Understood. Yes. So well, thank um, you ever so much. Yes, you all have stage two, so I may help out with stage two because I, I was supposed to do it earlier, but I was unable to make the classes. Um, I had previous obligations when I guess you all had first started. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So hopefully thank we you. would have helped you in um direction, and I guess um you all will continue next week. Y'all don't have much more to go, so y'all should be quite prepared now. Eh? You only have one more chapter to do. Right. So y'all are prepared for the exam by now. Ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All the best. And Great. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Good evening. Bye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.